Okay. Um, Hi, I just want to thank everyone for coming to today's webinar. Um, we're going to be covering the CFPB's new ability to repay qualified mortgage rule. Uh, we'll be doing an overview and insight on these compliances and implement implementation issues coming down the road. Um, I'm Laura Height, the corporate trainer here at Coaster VMS. Uh, we're a national appraisal management company. Um, before I introduce your host and the presenter, um, I would just like you to know that if you have any questions, just enter them in the question box and we will try to answer them at the end and we'll hopefully try to get to all of them. If not, um, we will get your information and answer them as quickly as possible. Uh, today's host is going to be Brian Coaster, the CEO of Coaster VMS. And here's Brian. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. And uh, welcome everyone to this afternoon's webinar. Um, it is really, really our pleasure to uh, host this webinar with Jim Milano from the law firm uh, Wiener, Brosky and Titer. Uh, you know, they are the primo law firm in the D.C. area. Let me just kind of say a little few words about, about Jim um, and the topic. Uh, the CFPB's new ability to repay and qualified mortgage rules will be covering. And uh, we'll be having other webinars just like this one in the near future uh, on other bureau rules and uh, just to keep everyone up to date on what's going on in the mortgage industry. Um, in addition to this rule we'll talk about today, the Bureau has issued five or six other very important uh, detailed rules. While most of these rules will be going into effect in the year 2014, uh, participants in the mortgage industry will have to begin the implementation of this pretty much right away. Dave Stevens was quoted as saying, uh, this is a year of implementation, uh, 2013. Uh, with all the CFPB and Dodd-Frank regulations and all the changes, there's a lot going on. Um, implementation is generally a three-part process. The first part of the process is reviewing, um, reviewing and understanding and deciphering the information, and that's what's the purpose of this webinar. Uh, the next part is the planning, reviewing, updating the policies and procedures, as well as reviewing all the segments of both your enterprise and to implement all these changes with the new rule. Uh, the final stage is making the changes, the system changing, testing those changes, and training your personnel on those changes. Uh, here at Coaster, uh, we like to help with this as much as possible, and that's why we help. Uh, we've hooked up this webinar with Jim. Jim is law firm is the primo law firm in the D.C. area, and uh, by he is is an honor and a privilege to have him. Just to give you a little bit about Jim, Jim's the uh, partner with the law firm Wiener Brodsky, it's a Washington, D.C. based law firm. Uh, Jim's practice focuses on regulatory compliance matters related to the financial services industry. He represents, advises mortgage companies, financial institutions, secondary markets, investors, um, issues on state, and li state mortgage licensing and SAFE Act related compliance, FHA lending programs, rules and guidelines, uh, responding to federal, state and audits and administrative enforcement actions. Uh, state laws and regulations concerning disclosures, allowable fees, prohibited practices, federal preemptive and statement laws, federal laws regarding to TILA, RESPA, uh, FDCPA, HMDA, FCRA, and GBLA privacy, and the implementation of Dodd-Frank and CFPB rulemaking. So we have got a, for those who've got that, we've got a doozy for you today. Uh, we're excited about everyone being here. People are piling in. And we're going to go ahead and turn this over to Jim. Jim? Thank you, Brian. And good afternoon, everyone. First of all, Brian and Laura, I want to thank you for asking me to do this today and also do a, do a sound check uh, to make sure uh, that everyone can hear me. Can you hear me OK? I can hear you loud and clear. And let's see. Everyone seems to be OK. Got no hands raised. So. OK. So let's get started. I want to take about 40 minutes just to go over the new rule and uh, try to leave a little bit of time for questions. I know everyone's time is tight in these busy days. So we're going to try to break um, at 3 o'clock today, but try to leave time for questions. Also, if we don't get to all of your questions uh, or we don't have sufficient time to answer all the questions that come in, um, you guys, everyone on the call <clears throat> should feel free to reach out to Brian and Laura at Coaster Appraisals or to myself. I'll give you my contact information at the end if you have any questions at all about this rule. 
So today's agenda, we're just going to go over a brief history of suitability in mortgage lending. Uh, then we're going to give an overview of the rule. We'll do a deeper dive into the definition of qualified mortgages. I'm going to talk briefly at the end about a concurrent proposal that came out with the final ability to repay and qualified mortgage rule. Uh, we'll talk real briefly uh, about the interplay of this rule with other bureau rules and other agency rules um, that are pending. Um, and then uh, we're going to uh, give an overview of what we think this rule will mean for the mortgage industry going forward. And I'll share with everyone towards the end some of the questions that we're already receiving here at our firm from our clients and members of the industry. And again, we'll try to leave a little bit of time to take questions from the audience. Just as a backdrop, the first reported case of suitability in consumer financial services was actually a lawsuit that was tried in 1942 against a securities broker's uh, boiler room operation for the selling of penny stocks to a little old lady. And the, the ruling in that case was this type of investment was not suitable for that investor. The broker-dealer should have known better. The mortgage industry, particularly mortgage lenders and banks, have historically resisted having a suitability standard applied or imposed upon them in mortgage lending. But the concept of the seed of suitability in mortgage lending was planted for the first time, we believe, in 1994 when Congress amended the Federal Truth in Lending Act uh, through the enactment of HOEPA, or the Homeowners, uh, Home Ownership and Equity Protection Act. Uh, and the Federal Reserve Board, the precursor to the Bureau in the Reg V area, finalized that rule in 1995. What came after that was, was a series of state actions. New York and North Carolina were the first to enact state-level high-cost home loan laws or regulations. And both of these initiatives were based on federal HOEPA, but generally had lower points and fees and thresholds and other requirements that go on beyond federal law. Importantly, these laws did not prohibit the making of certain loans. It just said if you made certain high-cost loans, you had to give additional disclosures and other protections were put into place, not the least of which was ASME liability. Um, in 2001, the Federal Reserve Board added an ability to repay requirement to high-cost home loans under federal law uh, and Regulation Z. Uh, and leading up to the financial crisis in 2007 and 2008, many states started to add their own laws in, in subprime mortgage laws that went beyond high-cost home loan laws. There were lower points and three fees thresholds that if those lower points and fees or thresholds were, tri were tripped or triggered, there were ability to repay uh, assessments. Over 20, almost 30 states had such laws. Uh, during this time, states also began to enact uh, net tangible benefit requirements. In 2008, the Federal Reserve Board proposed a higher price mortgage loan rule, which is important for the rule we'll talk about today. Everyone's familiar with that, HPML. That became effective in October of 2009. And then, of course, the next year in the summer of 2010, the Dodd-Frank Act was enacted. And Title 14 of the Dodd-Frank Act is the Mortgage Reform and Anti-Predatory Lending Act, which contains the ability to repay and qualified mortgage rule, which is what we'll talk about today. So in Section 1411 of the Dodd-Frank Act, it basically says no creditor shall make a loan unless the creditor makes a reasonable and good faith determination based on verified and documented information that at the time the loan is made, the consumer has the, a reasonable ability to repay the loan according uh, to its terms, including taxes and insurance and mortgage insurance and assessments. That's in the statute. So what Congress did through the Dodd-Frank Act almost three years ago was to legislate good business judgment, underwriting. Underwriting is now required pursuant to a federal statute. And this was the statute that required the Bureau and the Federal Reserve Board before the Bureau to enact the regulations. And we'll talk about that towards the end. A lot of people ask, why is the Bureau doing this? Because Congress created the Bureau and required them to do it. So it's required by law. Um, Section 1411 of the Dodd-Frank Act also added to the Federal Truth in Lending Act uh, requirements for the basis of a 
of the determination of a borrower's ability to repay a mortgage. So a lot of the detailed underwriting requirements that we'll see today are actually in the statute. That's why the Bureau also had to place them in the regulation. Section 1412 of the Dodd-Frank Act sets out the parameters of a qualified mortgage. Section 1413 of the Dodd-Frank Act amended the liability provisions under the Federal Truth in Lending Act uh, to, among other things, provide consumers with a defense to foreclosure by way of set-off or recoupment for the life of the loan if there's a violation of, among other things, the ability to repay provisions that we'll be talking about today. That's why this rule is so important. If you do not follow the rule, the borrower will have a defense to foreclosure at least up to a certain dollar amounts, basically for the life of the loan. Uh, and this set-off or recoupment can include TILA damages, which includes statutory damages, actual damages, and three years of finance charges, and attorney's fees and court costs. Importantly, these extended liability provisions apply to assinees of the mortgage also. Uh, another important amendment to the Federal Truth in Lending Act made by the Dodd-Frank Act extended the statute of limitations from one year to three years, and that's basically the time period within which a borrower can bring a lawsuit. It used to be a year, now it's going to be three years. Section 1414 of the Dodd-Frank Act also added some very important restrictions on prepayment penalties on mortgage loans. So in May of 2011, the Federal Reserve Board, which still had authority at that time over truth and lending, proposed an ability to repay qualified mortgage rules. So we have a new acronym in Washington, D.C., and a lot of what we do here in D.C. is create acronyms. And the new acronym for this rule is ATR-QM, Ability to Repay and Qualified Mortgages. On July 21, 2011, which is the so-called designated transfer date, that's the date that authority over the Federal Truth in Lending Act and 17 or so other enumerated consumer laws or Federal Consumer Financial Services laws transferred to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. It transferred to the Bureau uh, from other agencies, mostly the Fed, but the Bureau also picked up the SAFE Act rule from HUD uh, and also inherited some of the authority and power of the FTC. In um, in the in uh, actually in that date is wrong. In June of 2012, not 2011, the bureau reopened the comment period on the uh, proposed ATRQM rule in several distinct areas, including the use of DTI ratios and residual incomes in underwriting a qualified mortgage and the litigation risk that might arise from using a rebuttable presumption versus versus a safe harbor. So uh, about a week or so ago, on January 10th, the Bureau published the final ability to repay qualified mortgage rule on its website, indicating that the rule will become effective within one year. So what we're talking about will be effective a year from now. And we have a year to get ready, as Brian said, and begin to implement this rule into our op operations. So the Bureau's ability to repay and qualified mortgage rule implements the statutory changes made by the Dodd-Frank Act to the Federal Truth in Lending Act. And even though it adopts many of the original proposals of the rule as set out by the Fed, it makes some very important changes. And here they are in a nutshell. There's basically four categories, and there's subcategories under, um, under um, the, the qualified mortgage definition. Uh, there's a general ability to repay requirement, which we will talk about today. There are qualified mortgages, but what the Bureau did in the final rule that was not in the Federal Reserve Board's rule is they created subclasses of qualified mortgages. Uh, the first class, a general qualified mortgage, the safe harbor protection will apply to that one. There's a higher priced qualified mortgage, uh, and we'll talk about what that is. If creditors make those loans, there's a rebuttable presumption of compliance, but not a full safe harbor. There are agency qualified mortgages, which include loans sold to Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac or insured by FHA. At the same time the Bureau issued this rule, they issued a concurrent proposal asking for comments for further exemptions 
to create other classes of qualified mortgages for non creditors uh, that operate on a nonprofit basis, certain home ownership stabilization programs, and qualified mortgages made and held in portfolio by small creditors. Uh, the last two are refinances of non-standard mortgages into standard mortgages and balloon payment qualified mortgages made by community lenders serving rural areas. Because we're limited on time today and because these last two exceptions or ways to uh, comply with the ability to repay rule are very limited and don't apply across the board, we're not going to spend any time today talking about refinances of non-standard mortgages or qualified balloon mortgages made by community banks serving uh, rural areas. We're going to focus our comments today on the general ability to repay requirements and the qualified mortgages, particularly the general qualified mortgage, the higher price qualified mortgages, and the agency. Welcome to GoToWebinar, web events made easy. We will tell you that comments are due on those other proposed types of qualified mortgages yeah. by or before February 25th. I'll stop right there. Do we have a comment or a question? Okay, let me move on. So what does this apply to? The ability to repay rule applies to consumer credit transactions secured by a dwelling. It does not apply to business purpose loans. Welcome to GoToWebinar, web events made easy. It does not apply to HELOCs, reverse mortgages, timeshares, temporary bridge loans with a term of 12 months or less, or construction phase loans of 12 months or less, the construction phase of a construction to permanent loan. Uh, so the rule tracks the statute. A creditor shall not make a loan that is a covered transaction unless the creditor makes a reasonable and good faith determination at or before consummation that the consumer will have a reasonable ability to repay the loan according to its terms. So unless a covered transaction is a qualified mortgage, a refinance of a non-standard mortgage into a standard mortgage, or a balloon payment qualified mortgage, unless it's one of those three, and we'll talk about qualified mortgages in a second, that's a big exception and we think that's where all the action is going to be, but if it's not a qualified mortgage or a refinance of a non-standard mortgage or a balloon qualified mortgage, then in determining the consumer's repayment ability, the creditor is required by law to consider eight criteria. And here they are. And it's underwriting. This is all underwriting if you look at it. You have to look at the consumer's current or reasonably expected income or assets other than the value of the dwelling. Uh, if the creditor relies on the income from the consumer's employment, uh, you have to verify the consumer's employment status. You have to look at the consumer's monthly payment on the covered transaction calculated in a specified manner. Uh, you have to look at the consumer's monthly payment on any simultaneous loans that the creditor knows about. You have to review the consumer's monthly payment obligations for mortgage-related items. You have to review the consumer's credit uh, current debt obligations, alimony, and child support. You have to review the consumer's debt-to-income ratio or residual income, and you have to review the consumer's credit history. These are the eight criteria to satisfy the general ability to repay rule. There are specific rules under each one of these criteria, and we're just going to go into some of them. Um, uh, you know, under income and asset, under employment, under ma mortgage payment obligations, uh, and, and DTI or residual uh, income, there are specific underwriting rules that are required. So in verifying the consumer's income or assets, the creditor must follow specific rules, and we're going to talk about those in a second. A creditor uh, in verifying employment, if they do not get a written verification of employment, they can make an oral verification of that, but they have to prepare a record of having obtained that information. Uh, if in verifying debt information on the consumer, if a creditor relies on a consumer's credit report to verify a consumer's current debt obligations and the consumer's application states that uh, provides or has a debt listed on there that's not shown on the credit report, then the rule does not require the creditor to independently verify such obligation. 
I just want to give you a flavor that under each one of these eight criteria, there are detailed rules spelled out in the rule for underwriting the loan properly pursuant to the rule. And again, we're on the general rule. We're not even in qualified mortgages yet. So under, under uh, criteria one in verifying the consumer's income or assets, a creditor must verify the amounts of income or assets the creditor relies on under criteria one of eight criteria that you have to go through to determine the consumer's ability to repay. You have to use third-party party records, and those third-party records must provide reasonably reliable evidence of uh, the borrower's uh, income or assets. They don't tell you what type of third-party records. What's mandatory is you must use third-party records. So effectively, um, I think this does away with stated income or no-doc loans. So the rule is mandatory that you must verify income through third-party records, but they give you options as to how to do that. So you may verify a consumer's income by looking at tax returns. Uh, you may look at other records, you know, W-2s, pay, payroll statements, financial institution records, such as bank statements for assets, uh, records from the consumer's employer, records from a government agency if the consumer receives government benefits, uh, receipts from um, check cashing services, or receipts from the consumer uh, if the consumer uses a fund transfer service. So these are examples of other records that the creditor may use to verify income or assets. It's not mandatory. What is mandatory is you must verify income or assets through third-party records that give reasonably reliable evidence of the consumer's income and assets. And again, these are suggested criteria, not mandatory. The Bureau is just giving you some suggestions as to how you may do this. So there are rules for calculating monthly payments under the uh, general ability to repay rule. So except for certain loans with balloon payments or interest-only loans and negative AM loans, which those we're not going to cover those today, a creditor must calculate the consumer's monthly payment using the fully indexed or any introductory interest rate, whichever is greater, and uh, the fully amortized payment uh, that are uh, substantially equal. So you have to underwrite um, to the greatest interest rate as if it's fully end in calculating the borrower's ability to repay the monthly payment. Under criteria seven, in calculating the monthly DTI ratio or residual income, if a creditor considers the consumer's DTI ratio, the creditor must consider the ratio of the consumer's total monthly debt obligations to the consumer's total monthly obligations. If a creditor uses the residual income approach, the creditor must consider the consumer's remaining income after subtracting the consumer's total monthly debt obligations from the consumer's total monthly income. Detailed underwriting rules in a rule that carries with it serious liability and s and &E liability. So this is the general rule. This is just to recap. We're just going to review. The general rule is a creditor shall not make a loan that's a covered transaction unless the creditor makes a reasonable and good faith determination at or before the closing of the loan that the consumer will have a reasonable ability to repay the loan according to its terms. Again, there's generally four ways to meet this requirement, and two of them at the bottom that are italicized are of very limited applicability to the larger, broader general mortgage industry. So really, we're looking at two ways to qualify with, uh, with the ability to repay rule. One is the general ability to repay requirement which is all the stuff that we just went through, the eight criteria. You follow all of that stuff, and that's what's bold uh, right here, the general ability to repay requirement. Or another way to meet it is to make a qualified mortgage, and we're going to talk about that now. We're going to move to qualified mortgages. There are five or six potentially new classes of qualified mortgages. Now, uh, three uh, of these are, are proposed and are not out yet, but three of them are in the final rule. There's a qualified mortgage that comes with it, that carries with it a safe harbor, that gives creditors making the loan a safe harbor from liability. There's a higher price qualified mortgage that carries with it a rebuttable presumption 
There are agency qualified mortgages, and then we have some other proposals in the concurrent proposal for some other types of qualified mortgages. Let's talk about a qualified mortgage and what that is. Generally, a qualified mortgage is one that meets six criteria. First of all, it has to be fully amortizing, plain vanilla. Cannot have a loan term that exceeds 30 years. And cannot have points and fees that exceed 3% of the loan amount for loans of 100000 or more. And there are higher points and fees threshold for lower loan amounts. We'll talk about that in a second. Those are the first three of the six criteria. Um, the next three is the creditor has to underwrite the, the borrower's ability to make the monthly payment and mortgage-related obligations using the maximum interest rate that will apply during the first five years of the loan and the periodic payments of principal and interest that will repay either the outstanding balance over the remaining term of the loan or the loan amount over the term. So that's number four, underwriting monthly payments and the borrower's ability to make the monthly payment. Number five is, and this is similar to the general rule, the creditor has to consider and verify the consumer's income and assets and their debt obligations uh, pursuant to a very detailed Appendix Q that we'll talk about in a second. And finally, a qualified mortgage um, can only have a DTI ratio, a back-end ratio of 43%. And the ratio, there's very detailed rules in Appendix Q that determine how the ratio is determined. So what is Appendix Q? It's an attachment to the Qualified Mortgage Rule with very detailed standards for determining a borrower's, a borrower's monthly debt and income, including the consumer's eligibility for income, salary, if they have a family-owned business, there's detailed underwriting rules uh, for self-employed individuals, and there's very detailed rules on tax return analysis. It's very similar to FHA underwriting rules and uh, analogous to all of the detailed rules for Fannie and Freddie. Uh, there's rules for reviewing non-employment related income alimony and child support, investment, trust income, rental property, military, and non-taxable income. And there's very detailed rules in underwriting consumers' liabilities, uh, both recurring and non-recurring. I'm going to talk about this at the end, but I want to back up. So a qualified mortgage is six criteria. The six criteria can be broken into three buckets. The three criteria here, you see, are limitations on loan terms. It has to be fully amortizing, can't exceed 30 years, can't have points and fees in excess of 3%. Those are the first three criteria. The second three all relate to underwriting. Underwriting the borrower's ability to make the monthly mortgage payment. Underwriting the borrower's income and assets and debt obligations in a 43% DTI ratio. So the definition of a qualified mortgage is a hybrid between restricting loan terms and requiring certain underwriting requirements. We talked about Appendix Q. So points and fees, just a, a few minutes on points and fees. The definition of points and fees under the Qualified Mortgage Rule is based off of the definition of points and fees under Section 32, which is the Reg Z high cost home loan provisions. Unfortunately, there was a glitch in the statute and both for the new Section 32, which we're not going to talk about today, that will be the subject of a future webinar, but also for purposes of qualified mortgages, points and fees include payments to loan originators. But the concurrent proposal that I mentioned is asking for comments on that, whether it should be included or whether there should be a calculation to guard against double counting where Linda charges points and uses some of those points to pay a loan officer or a loan originator or a broker, and comments on that are due by February 25th. We will be reviewing and writing comments on that. If anyone has any ideas or wants to submit anything or wants to see the concurrent proposal and wants to talk about this before February 25th and get your voice heard, let me know. The other big one is points and fees for the Qualified Mortgage Rule includes non-finance um, uh, charge closing costs paid to the creditor or a loan originator 
or an affiliate of either one of them. Um, so this is appraisal fees, title fees, all of your closing costs that historically were not included in finance charges or points and fees will now be included in points and fees for purposes of not only the high cost rule, which we're not talking about today, but also the points and fees rule for the definition of qualified mortgage if those fees are paid to, importantly, an affiliate of the creditor. That's a big issue in the industry now. A lot of lenders have affiliated business arrangements with title companies, uh, and this has a lot of people concerned. So a covered transaction is not a qualified mortgage unless the transaction's total points and fees, again, as defined in Section 32, do not exceed for a loan an amount greater than or equal to $100,000, 3%. For a loan that's between $60,000 and $100,000, it's going to be a dollar cap of $3,000. Uh, for loans of $20,000 or less, or, uh, uh, I'm sorry, for loans of $20,000 up to $60,000, it's 5%. And for, for low balance loans, it's 8%. Um, so again, points and fees under Section 32 means finance charges, points, discount points other than the interest rate, all compensation paid directly or indirectly by a consumer or a creditor to the loan originator. That's the big one. This is a change under the Dodd-Frank Act. It also includes prepayment penalties. Um, and again, bona fide third-party charges closing costs that are not retained by the creditor, a loan originator, or an affiliate of either are excluded from points and fees. But if, for instance, an affiliate of the lender, a title company, charges a title insurance premium, that would be included in points and fees. And 3%, you've got one origination point, you've got some other costs, um, you know, that you could reach 3% very quickly and not meet the definition of a qualified mortgage. Uh, points and fees also do not include FHA upfront MIP. Uh, it doesn't include uh, private mortgage insurance, borrower paid, ongoing borrower paid mortgage insurance, or upfront borrower paid mortgage insurance if that upfront borrower paid mortgage insurance premium is not greater than the same premium amount that would be charged on a comparable FHA 203B loan and further provided that that upfront private mortgage insurance premium is refundable on a pro rata basis if the loan is paid off early. Uh, there's also an exclusion for points and fees under Section 32 and therefore under the qualified mortgage definition of points and fees for bona fide discount points. Uh, you can exclude up to one or two bona fide discount points if the APR does not exceed the average prime offer rate by more than one or two points. So if it doesn't exceed it by more than one point, you can exclude up to two bona fide discount points. If it doesn't, ex if the APR does not exceed the APR by more than two points, you can exclude up to one bona fide discount point. And again, non-finance charges, closing costs are excluded from points and fees as long as they're reasonable. The creditor receives no direct or indirect compensation in connection with those charges. And importantly, the charge is not paid to an affiliate of the creditor. So let's talk about agency qualified mortgages for a second. Um, if a covered transaction meets the first three loan tests, again, the loan term test, it's fully amortized, it's a 30-year loan term or less, not greater than 30 years, and the points and fees are 3% or less, then it can be a qualified mortgage if it's purchased or guaranteed by Fannie or Freddie while they're in conservatorship or receivership under FUFA, the Federal Conservatorship Agency, or any limited life you know, entity that succeeds either one of the GSEs when they come out of uh, conservatorship or receivership. Or if it's insured by HUD, and those are the big two, quite frankly. So what's going on in the mortgage industry today? Anywhere from 70 to 80% of loans that are being made are Fannie or Freddie eligible and are ultimately being sold to Fannie or Freddie. So that takes you up to 70, 80%, depending on what part of the country you're in. And then another 20 plus percent are FHA insured. 
And then you've got loans guaranteed by the VA, uh, USDA, or, or the RHS. But uh, VA, USDA, and RHS are much more limited than FHA insured or Fannie and Freddie loans. So 80 to 90 percent of what's being originated out there today is either Fannie or Freddie eligible and being sold to Fannie or Freddie, or is FHA insured. So if you meet the loan criteria, full AM, 30-year term or less, 3% points and fees or less, and the loan is sold to Fannie or Freddie or insured by HUD or, or guaranteed or insured by one of these other agencies, then it's a qualified mortgage. And I'm just calling that an agency qualified mortgage. Um, the important thing about an agency qualified mortgage is there's no DTI ratio mandated by the Bureau. Now, there are and may be DTI ratios mandated by the agency pursuant to their underwriting guideline, guidelines or FHA, but there's no Reg Z rule that the DTI ratio has to be 43% or, or below. Um, the other thing is, if any of these agencies publish rules for qualified mortgages under their respective programs, as is allowed by the Dodd-Frank Act, then the above bureau rule on agency qualified mortgages shall expire or sunset. And in any event, uh, if they don't do that buyer before January 2021, which sounds like a long time away, but it'll be here before you know it, uh, these provisions for agency qualified mortgages will sunset in January of 2021. Now, one other thing. This is the last category of qualified mortgages, and it's a it's a higher price covered transaction. If a qualified mortgage is a higher price covered transaction, then the creditor and an assignee of such loan only has a rebuttable presumption of compliance with the ATR with the ability to repay rule. To rebut the presumption of compliance under the rule, the borrower would have to prove, despite meeting the requirements of a QM, the creditor did not make a reasonable and good faith determination of the consumer's repayment ability at the time of closing by showing that the consumer's income, debt obligations, alimony, child support, and the consumer's uh, monthly payments, including the mortgage payment on the loan, um, would leave the consumer with insufficient residual income or assets other than the value of the property uh, to meet living expenses, including any recurring or non-material uh, non-debt obligations of which the creditor was aware at the time of closing. So higher priced qualified mortgages are not going to be subject to a safe harbor. If you make a qualified mortgage and the points and fees are, it's not a high, I'm sorry, it's not a high price covered transaction, then you are deemed to have complied with the ability to repay requirement. If it's a higher price transaction, you're deemed to have complied, but the consumer has a rebuttable presumption. So what is a higher price covered transaction? Well, as we said in the beginning, in the, in the 2008, effective 2009, the board put in higher price mortgage rule, and a higher price covered transaction is a first lien transaction where the APR exceeds by more than 1.5 percentage points the average prime offer rate. For second lien loans, it's 3.5 percentage points. And there's the test right there. The catch is, unlike the general higher price mortgage loan rule, a higher price covered transaction under the qualified mortgage rule does not have an exclusion for jumbo loans. So this will apply to any loan regardless of loan amount, conforming or otherwise. So if it's a higher price mortgage loan, you don't meet the safe harbor. So what would happen? You would have a higher price mortgage loan, but it would still have to be fully am, 30 years or less, um, no more than 3% points and fees, and meet the other three underwriting requirements. And you do all of that. But if the APR is in excess of 1.5 percentage points of the average prime offer rate, which is a primary market survey rate published by Freddie Mac, which is around 3% these days, so based on today's numbers, you'd be looking at an APR of 4.5%. It's rather low. Um, if you go above that, you have a higher price covered transaction. And you would still have to, if you wanted to qualify for the qualified mortgage provision, do all of those other things but only get a rebuttable presumption, not a safe harbor.
the Bureau created this other category, we think, to split the baby, to satisfy the mortgage industry to give them a safe harbor, but also satisfy the consumer advocates to give some, some protection. Uh, a few more slides here, and, and, and we'll wrap it up and open it up for questions. So concurrently with the issuance of the final ability to repay and qualified mortgage rule, the Bureau issued a concurrent proposal and proposed certain exemptions from the ability to repay requirement or for certain creditors to make qualified other classes of qualified mortgages. There was a proposal for nonprofit creditors, uh, certain homeownership stabilization programs, and qualified mortgages made and held in portfolio by certain small uh, creditors. The Bureau also requested comments on revisions to the inclusion in the 3% points and fees test for qualified mortgages of certain loan originator fees. Uh, and that's going to be very important. I know industry is looking at that and comments on all of this, including whether we're going to include all um, of loan originator fees in the 3% points and fees for qualified mortgages or come up with some sort of netting test so they're not double counted. Those comments are due by or before February 25th next month, less, uh, about a month away. So let's talk about the interplay of this agency rule with other agency rules, uh, with other bureau rules and other agency rules. So also in early January 2013, the bureau issued, also issued final rules, seven other rules. So there's a, a HOIPA or a high cost home loan revisions and counseling requirements that were issued pursuant to the Dodd-Frank Act. There's new escrow rules under the Truth in Lending Act. Um, there's there's a new massive new mortgage servicing rule. There's uh, also new escrow rules under ACOA and Reg B regarding delivery of appraisals to consumers. There's also a new rule for appraisals on higher price mortgages, which are defined similar to what we talked about. For those higher price mortgages, uh, appraisers are going to have to perform an internal inspection of the home. They have to going to go. They're going to have to go inside the home. Um, that's already required on FHA insured loans, but that will be required on all loans under under uh, Reg Z, and that's a multi-agency rule. And there was also a new LO comp rule that just came out now. Uh, with the exception of the escrow rules under TILA, which become effective this June, most of these other rules generally become effective um, in January of, of 2014. Uh, the last thing I want to mention here is the risk retention rules and qualified residential mortgages. That has yet to be finalized. That's a multi-agency rule. It deals with securitizations and risk retention, skin in the game, so to speak. Those rules were proposed in the spring of 2011 and have not been finalized. Again, that's a multi-agency rule. It doesn't even involve the Bureau. It involves the Fed, HUD, the SEC, uh, and some other agencies. Uh, but the important thing there is a qualified residential mortgage, a QRM, under the risk retention rules can be no broader than a QM under the ability to repay rules. And now that we have a QM, um, the agencies crafting the risk retention rule will, will be able to come up with a QRM. And the importance there is a QRM is an exception to the risk retention rule. So if you make a qualified residential mortgage, you can sell it and it can be securitized without the originator retaining any risk with respect to that loan. All other loans will have to have, you know, at least a 5% risk retention. Um, so just to recap, lenders cannot make mortgage loans without verifying the borrower's ability to repay. As we discussed, generally there's four ways to do this, and two are very limited exceptions that will not apply broadly. And those are qualified balloon loans made by certain creditors in rural areas and refinances of non-standard loans. So one way to meet the ability to repay rule is to verify the borrower's ability to repay under the general requirements. When we talked about that, remember there's eight criteria that have to be met to determine a consumer's ability to repay. Importantly here, even if you do all of this, 
under the general rule, there's no safe harbor or rebuttable presumption. Another way to meet the borrower's ability to repay requirement is to make a qualified mortgage. Again, remember, the general qualified mortgage criteria, there's three loan type criteria, fully amortized, 30-year, and 3% points and fees, and three underwriting criteria, which include underwriting the borrower's ability to make the payment, underwriting their income and assets and debts, and it includes a 43% DTI ratio. In addition to that, you can make an agency qualified mortgage. Again, it's the three loan criteria, full and 30-year term or less, 3% points and fees or less, and it meets the agency's underwriting criteria, but there's no bureau DTI ratio tied to those qualified agency qualified mortgages. Um, and then last but not least, there's a new category of higher price mortgage loans. If the APR exceeds 1.5 percentage points over the average prime offer rate and meets all the other requirements, um, full and 30-year, 3% points and fees, DTI ratio, underwriting payment income, assets and debts, if you do all of that but the APR is in excess of that threshold, then all you get is a rebuttable presumption. So that's the recap of everything we've talked about today. General ability to repay and qualified mortgages. That's it in a nutshell. So what's, what's this mean for the mortgage industry going forward? Um, it seems to me very unlikely that many lenders will make loans based solely on the ability to repay underwriting requirement, the general rule, the eight criteria. It seems to me that lenders will try to make qualified mortgages, and that's what they will focus on. Again, very, why? Because the rule contains a species of assignee liability. Um, standard qualified mortgages have a 43% back-end DTI ratio. Agency qualified mortgages do not have that mandated by Reg Z, but they may have their own requirements with respect to that number. So what does this mean? We've been talking about for years trying to get the government out of the mortgage business. Uh, Fannie and Freddie are in conservatorship. Um, FHFA is basically looking over their shoulder every day, uh, helping them run their obligations. That's a federal oversight agency. Fannie and Freddie have, for all intents and purposes, almost become themselves government agencies. So I think that this ability to repay qualified mortgage rule will only perpetuate the role of the federal government in the mortgage industry. It won't reduce it, it will cement it. And systems and vendor augmentation and reliance is going to be paramount. We have a whole new set of metrics that are going to have to be complied with. The 3% points and fees test, hyper-technical rules on underwriting requirements that if they're not met and they're not complied with will carry serious liability. And think about this. If you think you're going to make an agency qualified mortgage, I mean, how often do my clients make an FHA insured loan to get a notice of rejection or a notice of return that that loan's not insurable? So if you think you're making an agency qualified mortgage, but it turns out FHA will not insure it, all of a sudden you don't have a qualified mortgage. And also think about all the repurchases that Fannie and Freddie have undertaken over the past couple of years. Now, granted, a lot of that's on historical production, but you're gonna, if you're going to make agency qualified mortgages, and I know everyone pays a lot of attention to FHA requirements and Fannie and Freddie requirements today, but it's going to be even more important to pay attention to those requirements and make sure you get your FHA loans insured and make sure that the loans that you sell to Fannie and Freddie stay sold and don't come back. Because if they do, there's going to be a question as to whether they're even a qualified mortgage or not. And I would think if they're not, and you have to repurchase a loan from Fannie or Freddie or cannot get an FHA loan insured, you're basically going to have a toxic asset on your hand that you're going to be very hard pressed to resell. So. Here's some of the questions you're receiving. I mean, one of the first questions we got, is there an e liability for violating this rule? And the answer to that question is yes. If a creditor, an originator, makes a loan that does not meet the ability to repay requirement, 
or tries to make a qualified mortgage and it fails, whoever purchases that loan is subject to, for instance, the same defense to foreclosure for life of the loan by way of recruitment or set off. So that loan remains impaired you know, for the life of the loan. The other question we're receiving is, or affiliates fees included in the 3% points and fees test? And the answer to that is yes. And another question related to that is, how will this affect my joint ventures? Well, if you're a mortgage company that owns a mortgage brokerage 50-50 or 51%, 49% with a title agency, or um, you own a title agency 50-50 with a title insurance company, the fees that that title, that that JV charges are going to be included in the 3% points and fees. Um, will loan originator compensation be double counted for purposes of the points and fees test? Uh, that remains to be seen. That's part of the concurrent proposal that the Bureau has asked for comments on. Um, we intend to comment. We don't think there should be double counting. Um, this was mandated by statute, the double counting, if you will. We think it was a statutory glitch and a drafting error. And to their credit, the Bureau has heard the industry's concerns about this, and they've opened it up for comment. They're going to accept comments. And my prediction on that one is before January of 2014, next year, that the Bureau is going to change this rule so that you know, if a creditor charges a borrower one point and then turns around and pays that point to a loan officer, it will not be double counted. Now, if the creditor pays the loan officer more than one point, the LO comp over the 1% uh, probably would be counted in points and fees. So what does that mean? Um, if you're a lender and you're charging one point and you're paying all of that to your loan officer, and you're taking some of your back-end premium and passing that along to your loan officer or mortgage broker, that overage will be, quote, unquote, double counted. Uh, one of the interesting questions is, is this really happening? <laughs> and when will it be effective? Yes, as I said in the beginning, the Bureau is not making all this stuff up out of whole cloth. They were mandated by statute to come up with these rules. They've been working on them for a very long time. It's been almost three years in the making. And this rule, as we've discussed, will be fully effective on January 10, 2014. So as Brian said at the beginning, not only this rule, but the other six massive rules, some of which are very massive, um, is going to make the year 2013 um, the year of implementation. I guess the good news is on or after December 21, 2012, at the end of the Mayan calendar, the world didn't really end. But we're stuck with having to deal with all this stuff. So, you know, I'm not sure which is worse. Um, is there any chance that Congress could overrule this rule? You know, I, 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 we get that question a lot. I don't know. We have a Republican House, but the Senate is controlled by the Democrats. Certainly, I think there will be a lot of legislation introduced, particularly in, in the House, to chip away at this bill. Whether any of that passes and gets through the Senate remains to be seen. There's certainly some good legislation that could be passed to clean up around the edges of this rule, to clear up points and fees, to do something to deal with, you know, including affiliate fees and points and fees. There's a lot of areas for improvement. Certainly Dodd-Frank will not be repealed. The Bureau is not going to be done away with. And Title 14, with all these mortgage changes, will not be rolled back. Will the mortgage industry be successful in its lobbying efforts to quote unquote chip away at the edges? Um, I, I certainly hope so. There's certainly room for improvement, and I hope that this year in 2013 that some legislation is passed and we can, you know, sort of make pieces of this rule that really do not make sense, sort of make sense out of them. So the last question, we get this a lot, particularly from small lenders and brokers, why are they doing all this stuff? Don't they realize they're going to put me out of business? No one makes toxic, exotic loans anymore. Why do we need all these rules? And again, the answer is Dodd-Frank, the Dodd-Frank Act that Congress passed, made these changes to the Federal Truth and Lending Act, to the statute, and also created the Bureau and mandated that the Bureau implement these regulations under these statutory changes. So. 
you know, it's not something that the Bureau is doing to us. It's something that the Bureau was required to do by Congress, and they, quite frankly, are just doing their job. And in many respects, uh, they're hearing the concerns of the mortgage industry. They're also hearing the concerns and the complaints of the consumer advocates and the plaintiff's lawyer, uh, the plaintiff's lawyers. That's why it's very important to, to make your voice heard. So at that, I will stop talking, and I will open it up for questions. Um, Laura, I will tell you on my end, I cannot see the chat box. So if you have any questions coming in, just repeat them. Okay. Thank you, Jim. I do have a couple of questions when it comes to the 43% uh, back-end DTI. Uh, doesn't apply to agency qualified loans. What type of loan does the DTI apply to? I'm getting a lot of questions about the 43 percent. Well, if, if you, a good question. I think that if you think about it, if you're not, so then the question becomes, what are you going to try to do? And one interesting thing here is, will lenders undertake belts and suspenders? Will they try to make agency qualified loans that otherwise meet the general qualified mortgage definition in the event that the loan does not get sold to an agency or does not stay, stay sold to an agency. So uh, the 43% DTI ratio would apply to conventional mortgages that are not FHA insured and that are not going to be sold to Fannie and Freddie. But what remains to be seen, good question, what remains to be seen, if you think back to the days when the federal government and the states first enacted anti-predatory lending laws, and this was more of a secondary market securitization credit rating thing, but what they did is the credit rating agencies went to the most restrictive common denominator and they said, you know, there's certain loans that we're just not going to rate. And so people stopped making those loans. And one of the interesting side effects of this rule may be that even though lenders may intend to sell a loan to the agencies out of fear that, you know, the loan may not get sold or may not stay sold, they may nonetheless incorporate a 43% back-end DTI ratio on all their loans, which then would drive borrowers with higher DTI ratios into FHA-insured loans, which has an interesting side effect or impact. But that, that's, that's a good question. I mean, it applies to conventional loans is the simple and short answer. Okay, I've got another one here from Nancy uh, Portwood. Uh, would this indicate that we will have to give up our relationship with our preferred title companies, even if we get nothing back from them? We will have to spread them around like we have uh, for our appraisals now. Good question. So affiliates are defined, uh, the definition of affiliate, they reference the rule in Section 32, and it's a company that controls, is under control or under common control with another company. It's, it's the definition of affiliate in the Bank Holding Company Act. If it's a non-affiliated third-party title company, and you don't own the title company, and the owners of the title company or mortgage company don't own each other. If it's not affiliate, uh, affiliated, then you can still use that title company, you know, subject to other requirements, uh, RESPA requirements on disclosure and required use and that type of stuff. You can still use that title company if it's your preferred provider uh, and not have that title company's title insurance fees or premiums included in points and fees as long as that title company is not affiliated with your mortgage company. But where this rule's really going to have an impact is on affiliated business arrangements, and a lot of mortgage companies have affiliated business arrangements with title companies, and that's going to be problematic in the future. So if you do not have an affiliated business arrangement with a title company today, then that particular provision of the 3% points and fees rule under the qualified mortgage definition should not be of concern to you. But it's certainly something you should look at. Okay, I have another one here from Corey Galinsky. Uh, do investment properties fall under the ATR QM? 
Um, good question. Technically, no, but you need to be really careful because some investment properties are subject to truth in lending. Uh, for instance, vacation homes or rental property that the consumer uh, would occupy more than two weeks out of the year. And uh, my view of that is uh, that was not on my list of what are the side effects going to be, but we might as well put it on the list because I think people are going to be very careful and very concerned to just willy-nilly make loans as investment property and treat them as you know non-consumer, non-owner occupied. If you make a mistake in that classification and it turns out it's not a business purpose loan but it is a consumer credit transaction and you did not follow these rules, you're going to have a to toxic asset on your hands. And I can tell you the golden rule, which is those who have the gold rule, and those are the investors, uh, beyond everything we've covered today, you can bet that the investors, the purchasers of loans, not just Fannie and Freddie, but the large purchasers of loans, are going to have very strict and stringent requirements that go beyond what we've reviewed today. Um, they're going to sort of, quote, unquote, back away from the edge. And they're going to have very strict requirements so that they can assure that they're not purchasing loans that are either non-qualified mortgages or, or that have not met the ability to repay underwriting requirements. Good question. Okay, and I've got one last question here. Um, and just to let everyone know that um, we are going to be uploading here we talked about. It's still a qualified mortgage. The only difference is that mortgage is not under the safe harbor you only get a rebuttable presumption, which says you, you met the qualified mortgage rule, but a borrower can come in and present evidence and rebut the presumption that you met the rule. So I truly question how many lenders are going to take a chance and make these types of loans. Got it, got it, got it. Okay, well, um, you know, this is Brian Koester. Thank you, thank you, Jim, and, and thank you, everyone. I think you know, from the feedback we've gotten, it has been great. 